Some of you know that at the age of 18 years of age, I was, um, to my own surprise, genuinely converted to the gospel. It was uh, not that I was not a church member prior to that, I was, but by the time I left and went away to university, my fascination actually was with Kierkegaard, not with the gospels. I was taking a class in existentialism. I was eating it with a spoon. I read people like Ian Rand, who now I scoff at how enamored I was with her gospel of human responsibility. And in the midst of all of that, um, as is often true for people who are freshmen in college and are exposed to this whole new world of philosophy and cross currents of thinking, challenging the authority of the church, I was also asking some pretty existential questions myself. Who am I? What, in fact, do I really believe? Um, what do I want to become? I'd already known that I really did not want like, to be like my parents. Uh, I did not have a particularly good relationship with them. I never lacked for anything financially, but as far as I was concerned, arrogant, rebellious teenager that I was, they, um, they really were a part of a kind of racist establishment in Richmond, Virginia, with which I really wanted no part whatsoever. And so I was cut adrift. When you make that kind of break and you say to the people who love you and raised you, I don't want to be like you, then at that point you're tasked with the enormous responsibility of reinvention, of whatever that in fact might mean. And so my questions were genuine and real. In the meantime, there was a woman in Richmond who I admired tremendously. Her name, all three are last names, Bruce Crane Fisher. And Bruce was a turned on, deeply believing, activist for racial justice Christian in the city of Richmond, absolutely unlike her peers in almost every way, except for the social register stuff. And therefore, she had incredible inroads in being able to, in essence, speak truth to her peers about the kind of racial explosions that were starting to happen in the city of Richmond at that time. Um, she was praying for me. I, I didn't know that, but she was. And she invited me to a weekend, a retreat that was held at the, Can not the Canterbury, sorry, the uh, retreat and conference center called Roslyn, which was an estate that was willed to the Episcopal Church. It was an interdenominational retreat, and in that weekend, I came to faith in Christ. The trigger, quite honestly, in the midst of my own questionings, though, was in the midst of a small group that I was participating in, uh, a man walked over, and this was part of what was happening, and stood by a woman who was in a wheelchair, prayed for her, and she got up out of the wheelchair. And I knew enough to know that this was not a staged event uh, for my entertainment or persuasion. Uh, I really was pretty much the only resident, I don't know what I believe person that was there at that retreat. But in this kind of split second logic way, it made sense. You see, I'd had some dabbling in the demonic as a curious teenager trying to figure out what the spiritual world was all about. I knew that someone could in fact curse someone and it would bring sickness. And so if Jesus took the curse, then of course someone could pray and that person would be healed. I mean, as I saw her stand up, it, it was like bing, 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 really fast. And I knew that God had done it. And that set me on an entirely different direction. Long story short, I became, I fell in love with Jesus. That's never changed. I met not long after that, a woman named Ruth Ward Heflin. Ruth Ward Heflin, Heflin was an extraordinary woman. She had none of the social graces that Bruce Crane Fisher had but all of the courage and the determination. Ruth was a Pentecostal pastor. She was the pastor of the Calvary Pentecostal Church, along with her brother, Wallace. 
It was kind of a family affair, as is true in some of those congregations. And it was through Bruce Fisher that I made the acquaintance of Ruth Heflin. God loved Bruce Fisher, and she had a wonderful plan for my life. I, uh, and so I went to a meeting that they had, and Ruth told her story. Her story was this, that God had really called her, in fact, to intercession and evangelism. She really didn't function as the pastor, per se, of Calvary Church. That was Wallace's job, her husband, her brother, rather. But what she did was that she preached the gospel on the streets and she traveled. And it was phenomenal. She had, in a room in her home, a Mercator projection of the world on the floor. And she would walk the globe and pray. And there would be times when she would be walking like this and she could feel the Holy Spirit say, no, no, you're headed north. And she'd go this way. And there were several times when she stopped and the Lord said, you're to go to this country. She met along the way. Now, we're talking about the 60s, so this is a long time ago. Indira Gandhi of India, other world leaders. She was an extraordinary woman, but what got my attention was the story about how she went to the country of Bhutan, a very tiny little kingdom on which the myth of Shangri-La is based, and uh, right up by India. And so, and what happened was this, the Lord told her she was supposed to go to, Pax, go to Bhutan, and she didn't even think about it for a second. She immediately began to start making arrangements to get the paperwork necessary for her to be able to go, passport in order and all of that. She began to pray and ask God to provide the money. This is not a person who was of any sort of significant means whatsoever. And Ruth, just to know, she's, she was about this tall, statuesque, and just like a lot of the Pentecostal women in her day, her hair was tied in a very tight bun yes. right up here on the back of her head. And so she made an impression when you, when you met Ruth. And so, sure enough, the money began to fall together. She contacted friends in Hong Kong and asked if she could stay with them and see what she could do about making arrangements to get from there to Bhutan, because at that point, Americans were not allowed into the country. So she arrived in Hong Kong, she's staying with friends, she's just insistent saying, okay, waiting on the Lord, what am I supposed to do? Guess who was showing up in Bhutan three days later? The prince of Bhutan, who was presenting his betrothed to some of the various leaders in and around the Far East. And it was like the Lord said, this is your chance. <laughs> so, and I'm not exaggerating, she found out when he was going to, when he, he and his fiance and entourage was going to land in a private plane on the airstrip in Bhutan, in Hong Kong. She went down to the airport. She went all the way, at that point, you could walk to the gates, remember, no TSA at that point. <laughs> and she spoke to the official and she said, I have a message for the Prince of Bhutan. I would like to go out on the runway and greet him. And no exaggeration, <laughs> the man from Hong Kong was about this tall, and he looked up at her, didn't really know what to do, and he just sort of said, go ahead. <laughs> so she went out on the tarmac, and here are all of these Hong Kong officials who have no idea who Ruth Heflin is whatsoever. And she's twice their size, by the way. <laughs> and so sure enough, down the walkway, the gangplank, comes the Prince of Bhutan and entourage. And he, of course, is greeting people like this as he is coming down the, hall, down the way. Well, Ruth is like, God, what am I going to do? Because what she had done is created a small business card that she was going to shake his hand and pass the card with her personal information asking for an audience. And so, he's doing this, he's doing this. Finally, he comes to Ruth and he does this and then he looks up. <laughs> and he does just like this and just impulsively sticks out his hand. She shook his hand, she gave him the note. She went back to the place where she was staying. Two days later, she got a telephone call from the private secretary of the prince inviting her to come. She came. She brought with her some small gifts, 
like an olive wood covered Bible, things like that. And she, she said, I have a request. I want to come and walk your country and pray for your country. I promise you what I'm not going to do is talk to try to get people to become Christians. That's not my focus. My focus is to pray for your nation. Will you allow me to come? And he said yes. So the very first American to ever set foot in the country of Bhutan was a Pentecostal woman who had no money whatsoever, who God opened the doors to be able to go, and it all began with her walking the floor of her room and praying for nations. David Wilkerson, another man, sort of a hero from that era, said, and I believe this, he said, how you come to faith and who you connect with marks you in a very significant way in terms of how you think about what the Christian life should look like. And that was very, very true for me. I had two um, competing but not um, conflicting streams in my life. One was the Episcopal Church. And I mean traditional Episcopal Church. 1928 prayer book Episcopal Church in a way that I'd, I would go through that liturgy and it would just sing the prayers of my heart and point the finger in places in my life where God needed attention. Um, it really wasn't until later that I began to get an interest in charismatic renewal and even contemporary Christian worship, but I would still rather sing the hymns than any of the I Love You Jesus songs. Just, and it's not because I don't love Jesus, but it's because there's ballast and content in that that literally disciples people as they sing, which is what I think one of the purposes of hymnody is. And then there's this other Ruth Heflin, Bruce Fisher, countless other people who, who are these sort of wild people who don't follow the rules at all. And yet, they are the ones who would be most at home in the story of Tabitha being raised from the dead. And that's why I tell the story. You see, the whole theme of Luke Acts, which ties right into the reading from Luke, where Jesus basically gives them the commission to go wait and receive power from on high, is that there is this flow that goes through the Gospels, not just Luke, that continue in the sense that the ministry of Jesus is manifested in Jesus. The ministry of Jesus is manifested in his disciples. And the theological groundwork actually is laid out in John, where John says to his people, you know, if you, if you can't believe me for my words, at least believe me for my work's sake. And what he's talking about has to do with miracles as well as the courage to confront the Pharisees, the capacity to be able to receive people no matter who they are and build a kind of ragtag group of people that broke the rules about clean and unclean, right and left, all of that is a part of the life and ministry of Jesus. And all of that is what is manifested in the book of Acts. And for the same reasons, as the collect offers, that the raising of Tabitha from the dead was a sign that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Now, why am I talking about any of this? What I'm talking about, because when I wrestle with the very things that you are, that have been brought to you wonderfully by Bishop Joe Bailey Wells, what I think of is a little sentence that came from the mouth of a woman named Catherine Meeks. Catherine Meeks came to this diocese for several, several years ago to do a one-day workshop on racial healing. And she, sends, she heads up a center for racial healing in Atlanta, Georgia. And she began to talk about all the things you would expect her to talk about in terms of paying attention to language and, and really deeply real kind of wrestling with your own history and how that shape, the, shapes the way you view other people and trying to get past the, you know, I'm not really a racist, but I sure don't want my daughter to marry a black man, you know, kind of stuff that's still very much a part of the life of our culture. And I, uh, and, but you know what she kept saying? And she said it in the sweetest, kindest, 
but sly way possible, she'd say, just be a little braver. And she said that more than once. And it was one of those times when her comment was literally the word of God going bing right here. Because again, that's what I think about when I think about the invitation to participate as the Acts invites us to into the life of Jesus. And to me, that's a much kinder invitation than the demand to be a certain way. There's two different ways of thinking about this. I want to present a contrast. One is the one that frustrates me, and it's from Thomas Merton. Now, I like Merton, but this is a quote from No Man is an Island, and this is what he says. It is of therefore of supreme importance that we consent to live not for ourselves, but for others. When we do this, we will be able to face and accept our own limitations. As long as we secretly adore ourselves, our own deficiencies will remain a torture to us and almost present an apparent, an apparent kind of defilement. But if we live for others, we will gradually discover that no one expects us to be as gods. We will see that we too are human, and like everybody else, we all have weaknesses and deficiencies, and that these limitations of ours play an important part in our lives. It shows us how much we need others. My issue is, he drops a bomb when he says, it is of supreme importance that we consent to live not for ourselves, but for others. Do you live for others all the time? Do you live for others even half the time? Is there a clarity of motive in your life that allows you to sort of be giving in a way that doesn't cause something else to register inside of you, hoping somebody thanks you or notices? I know the shadow self, as is said, that goes on in my heart, and I, I'm a bundle of impure motives, even at my, own, my most altruistic. I really do want to serve God with all of my heart. I really do want to serve people when they don't get in my way, <laughs> when they will do what I would like for them to be able to do. And so just to say, I'm not going to live for myself, but for others, only leaves me in the ditch. I don't know what to do with that. Better is this. This comes out of a dialogue in Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, where a wealthy woman asks an elderly monk how she might know if God exists. He tells her, no explanation or argument can ever achieve this. Only the practice of active love. You see, active love, not just the aspiration to, but the commitment to serve pushes me to the breaking point as it is meant to. The softening of my heart, the capacity to see with renewed eyes, to look, in, look at people and see opportunities for service, the capacity to, really, to realize in the depths of my soul that I need the power of the Holy Spirit if I'm going to, in fact, serve other people. That, for me, is the nutshell of you shall receive power from on high and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and the ends of the earth. You want me to go to the ends of the earth? I haven't left the Sea of Galilee my entire life. I mean, that's how radical you see, that is. In other words, I believe that the call to discipleship, the call to serve others, the commitment to active love, if taken seriously, literally dashes us against the rocks of our own desire for the comfortable life, for self-service, the capacity to be noticed and thanked in the midst of the sacrifices that all of us make, honestly, as a matter of course. And yet, this is something different. And when I really come face to face with the depths of my own limitations, 
It is only then that something begins to awaken in me, which is a cry for the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, and, that's, and it's ongoing. <laughs> that's why I think Paul says in Ephesians 5.18, literally, be ever being filled. My life is counting on the Holy Spirit to continue to ask for more because that self-centeredness, the sin in my life, is still, no matter how far I progress, still way too prevalent for me. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of death? You know, there's been a lot of scholarly ink spilled over whether that's a pre-Christian or a Christian cry from the heart. But my experience, I have to admit, has been that such a cry has never gone away in my life. And, and actually, from the other people that I know, the only exception to that is among the company of the self-confident. I am not one of those comp- in one of those companies. I will never be able to sing with Julie Andrews, I have confidence in me, from the sound of music. And it's not that there isn't confidence. It's the fact that I know, left to my own devices, I could be really dangerous. You see, a part of even the lure of being a channel that God uses by the power of his Holy Spirit is that power is intoxicating. Once that begins to happen, God speaks through you and people tell you that. I really heard the Lord speak to you. It can, it can get inside your blood before you ever, need, ever even know what's happening. And then what begins to happen, because we're so self-focused, is that we get the mistaken notion that whenever we get into the pulpit, we're going to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. And that creates a kind of inner cockiness in us so that all of a sudden the opinions that we utter up front have the same vocal tone, the same nuanced clarity as our exposition, It's the same voice. And therefore, people in our congregation are become, they are in the mistaken notion of assuming that your cocky opinions really are the word of the Lord. And then we're all sunk. I have seen it. And that's true for everything. If I'm laying my hands on the sick and they are recovering, let's do it right now. Just counting on the fact that that will happen. One of the things that I notice about the Tabitha story, did you catch this? Peter goes into the room, you know, Tabitha's dead on the bed. All the professional mourners and widows are there and they're raising the ruckus as was their custom. He gets them out of the way. He gets down on his knees. I don't know what he prayed, but my hunch is, well, Lord, what do I do now? (laughs) And then out of that hearing, I think, probably, from the Holy Spirit to be able to say to her, Tabitha, get up, it's okay. And bring her back to life. You see, Jesus puts it this way. I can do nothing except what I see the Father doing. Which means it's an invitation to live in the kind of relationship with God that's based in humility, a lack of of self-assurance, the genuine ongoing presence of being broken over the things in your life that you wish were not there, that are meant in your life to function as a kind of thorn in the flesh, so you know that the power is not from you, but it comes from God. And out of that kind of broken humility to have the anointed when God, anointing when God shows up to be able to say, okay, go do this. Regardless of whether it's in your comfort zone or not, regardless of whether you've never done it before, and to pursue and learn from people who exercise those kinds of ministries. That's what God was showing me in meeting people like Ruth and Bruce. It's a way of saying in some ways, come on, they're just like you, let's go. And I honestly believe with all of my heart that if we live within the context of what we believe in the creeds and what we say in the liturgy and the scripture, it asks of us to live as humble, broken, 
forgiven channels of the Holy Spirit's power. He will move through you in ways that may or may not look like the way that he moves through your sister or your brother in Jesus. But if it looks like Jesus, because that's the plumb line. How do you know it's the Holy Spirit? It looks like Jesus. You'll move and move ahead, and God will use you. And that kind of miraculous answer to prayer will begin to allow you to have the courage to speak even more openly about the trustworthiness of the gospel in the depths of your own broken humanity. You're actually not less real as a channel of the Holy Spirit. You're actually more real. Real in a way that allows the gospel to shine through you, even in the midst of the things that you wish weren't there. We have these treasures in earthen vessels that the power of God may be seen as coming not from us, but from God. So please, my beloved, do not read the story of Tabitha as mere history. See the story of Tabitha as an invitation. And know that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is as available to you as anyone in the history of the church. For you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses. If you want to just be a caretaker in the house of the Lord, you can do that. But if you want to see lives changed for the gospel, be a little braver.